Okay. Um, I think we're going to start tonight. We're, we're seeing that the uh, uh, attend participants are rolling in. Um, and so I'd like to welcome everyone to tonight's uh, ASES research uh, webinar series. Um, this is now our fifth webinar series and uh, our second for 2023. Uh, we did three back in 2022, and we'll have our third and final one for 2023 in September. Um, the uh, topic for tonight uh, is large database research. And um, uh, we've got a great uh, group of uh, faculty. I'm really uh, thankful that they are willing to take their time and and put together um, uh, their knowledge and, and share that with you with regards to very specific topics. Um, uh, first, uh, we're going to have uh, Uma Trikumaran from uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uma is going to talk about um, how to perform impactful systematic reviews and meta-analyses in shoulder surgery. Um, Next, we're going to have Chris Clifto, who's from Duke University. He's going to talk about how to effectively navigate the use of large public and private databases to produce high quality research. And then finally, we're going to talk with, uh, we're going to have Bill Mallon talk with us. Bill is uh, editor in chief of Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, as well as past president of the ASCS. And he's going to talk to us about um, how to determine which uh, big data research studies should or should not be published in shoulder surgery. So hopefully this will give the uh, viewers a really um, wide breadth of information going from uh, information about uh, top, um, uh, potentially um, areas of research that they can perform themselves, whether they're in an academic or a private institution. And similarly, what's the best strategy to be able to go about this to be able to get the research published. Um, tonight, uh, I'll be hosting this with Peter Simon, who's my uh, co-chief uh, for the uh, ASCS Research Committee, and um, we'll start it off uh, with Uma uh, talking about performing uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Uma? Uma, you're, uh, you're muted. Great. I'm just going to pull this up. Is that looking okay for everybody? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks uh, for the uh, invite. I'm looking forward to learning a lot myself. I'm going to be starting with uh, systematic reviews. So the objectives tonight, I think first I'm going to ask, why do we even need systematic reviews? We'll define what they are exactly then outline the overall steps involved. We'll identify the elements of the PRISMA statement. Uh, it's a 27 item checklist when presenting or publishing on systematic reviews. And we'll end with some limitations inherent uh, in this type of research. So why do we need a study of other studies? So I think there's three main categories or points uh, that our reasons for conducting systematic reviews. The first, of course, is simply quantity. The amount of literature is just tremendous. The pace in which it's being published is uh, very rapid and increasingly so. So the second issue is quality. So that can even vary amongst all these different studies, and there's likely substantial bias in which studies we're exposed to. And finally, there's controversy. Even when the quality is high, there can be significant controversy as different studies may have completely opposite conclusions. And we're all likely to cherry pick and find the evidence that supports some of our pre-existing you know, notions or ideas. So that's why systematic reviews really sit at the top of the evidence pyramid. They have rigorous and transparent methodology. They can collate into larger sample sizes and give an assessment of quality within that particular work. So if you're going to do a systematic review of case control studies, it would sit at this level of evidence and so on for each uh, type of study, the highest being a systematic review or meta-analysis of RCTs. So by definition, they are very reproducible and explicitly defined studies that use a transparent process for collecting the best available evidence to answer a very specific question. And they do that using very robust techniques at every step of the way from searching for and identifying the articles, selecting which ones to include and exclude, 
extracting the data, appraising the quality and the bias inherent in each of the studies, and finally synthesizing the data to something very digestible for the audience, right, the reader. So when we look at that for orthopedic journals, there is some room for improvement here. This is a study, this is back in 2013, but looked at several of our top journals and looking at the PRISMA statement, again, a 27 item checklist considered the standard for how we report systematic reviews. JBJ has had the highest rate at 77% of those items being included in systematic reviews that they're publishing, but all the other journals had less than that. So there is room for improvement in how we do this. There's also consideration for how many of these are being published, systematic reviews in general, and when do we need an updated systematic review. I think you can consider that if a long period of time has passed since the uh, uh, prior systematic review, and we pointed out already that there's, the rate of publications is so high that you may need systematic reviews more often than we've been used to in the past or perhaps there's some methodologic flaw that was identified in a prior review that you can improve upon, or perhaps prior reviews didn't focus on the specific outcome of interest that you had, and so it can be redone looking at it from a different perspective. So the systematic reviews really have seven or eight main steps. The first and perhaps the most important is identifying your research question, followed then by defining with a predetermined set of criteria, inclusion and exclusion, that you apply to a comprehensive literature search. You'll then select the studies based on that criteria and then go through a formal data extraction process for each of those studies, evaluate the quality and risk of each of those studies, and then synthesize that data, uh, including the quality of that data, and then finally uh, publishing. So starting with the first uh, point is identifying your research uh, question. Let's start with a bad example. So what are various colors of shoulder braces used in shoulder surgery? This isn't uh, particularly interesting. It's fairly trivial. Um, it does not address any sort of meaningful clinical outcomes. It lacks specificity. It doesn't specify the type of shoulder surgery or the context uh, in which the shoulder braces are being used. And it's really of limited scope. So I don't think it'd be very interesting to uh, the people consuming this uh, piece of literature. Let's look at a slightly better example of framing a good research question. So what is the effectiveness of arthroscopic versus open surgical techniques, for the treatment of recurrent anterior shoulder dislocation in adult patients? So here you have at least a specific surgical intervention, a particular condition, and a specified population, and you're trying to compare effectiveness for different surgical approaches. But even in this example, uh, arthroscopic and open techniques are, is, is very broad. There's a lot that falls under each of those categories, and that's not very specific. The effectiveness hasn't really been defined. What outcomes are we really looking at? Are we interested in recurrent dislocations? Are we interested in range of motion? Are we interested in return to sport? So there's a lot more additional specificity that can be added to generate a good research question. And there are some tools that you can use now to help develop that from the beginning. So you're really looking to get something very well defined, very clear to the reader with uh, well-defined terminology. So PICOS is a very commonly used framework and that refers to population. So among patients with frozen shoulder um, intervention does intra-articular cortisone, cortisone injection, a comparator intervention compared to physical therapy and an outcome result in faster recovery of range of motion and pain relief. And you're gonna specifically look at that in just randomized control trials. But here you have a much more specific question that the results of which I think most clinicians would want to know and could apply to clinical practice and be very valuable. There's some other frameworks as well, such as SPIDER, but they all kind of get at these various aspects or um, that you need to consider like population or your sample and what the specific outcome measures will be. It's optional, but it's probably a good idea to register your protocol these days. So Prospero is the primary database to do that. You can register your systematic review protocol that lets other people know what you're working on. And it might be a good place to look to see what other people are working on so you can avoid overlap and you know not uh, waste your time. This is a PICO template you can use, again, to establish that initial research question. If that's set up well, I think you're set up for success as you consider these additional steps. 
after you've defined that and considered your research question, you really need to look at additional terms. And this is, gets into the search strategy. You look at different index terms for those different parts of the framework, whether population or intervention or the comparator groups or the outcome. You want to find the synonyms, all the related terms, the acronyms or variant spellings even. And you may start with looking at a prior systematic review or related articles to start collecting these terms. And then you're going to take those terms and with these Boolean operators or an and, you're trying to operationalize now your research question. You're going to build it in terminology that a computer could use to really do that search uh, for you. So you're gonna take all those terms in the columns with, combine them with and, uh, or sorry, or, and then all the columns together with and to generate your search string. Um, and then from that collection, you'll apply a set of inclusion and exclusion criteria. So these also need to be very clearly stated and predetermined. You're going to consider the whole spectrum of things, whether it's your study population, the design itself, intervention types, the comparator groups, and the specific outcomes. And we'll hear a lot more about some limitations of the different databases that you can use to uh, collect this type of uh, information. So with the inclusion and exclusion criteria, by convention, you start with your whole population. You first apply the inclusion criteria that are generally stated in a positive way. You have to have a rotator cuff tear of four centimeters in an adult population, 40 to 80, for example. That gives you your potentially eligible group of people. And then you apply your exclusion criteria. So uh, maybe you're avoiding individuals that have cortisone injections in the past uh, month prior to this study, things of that nature. That leaves you with your study population. So when you think about starting your literature review, constructing your question, forming your research strategy, it's really wise to work with a librarian, especially in this day and age, there's a tremendous amount of data out there. You just may not be aware of certain databases that exist that your librarian is more familiar with, and they can really help you design a very comprehensive search strategy across a variety of these different databases. They're very familiar with those search strings and those Boolean operators. They can make sure that uh, you're purposeful with how you search. That's an important part of conducting these systematic reviews. And there's uh, lots of reference managers, EndNotes, Zotero, Covidence, Mendeley, that can be helpful in managing this amount of information. And these managers can, the data managers and softwares can help track the references. It's important to, for publication and for understanding and replication, to understand what happened with all these references. Why did you include them or exclude them? What happened to the ones that were discarded? And so others can consider uh, the same methodology if it needs to be reproduced uh, in the future. And the data software also, of course, would allow you to create citations easily and generate your bibliography uh, in the end. And they can look like this. They're very simple to use. A lot of them are web-based. This is Covenants, for example. And then when you go about applying your criteria, often we do end up, you know, starting with a tremendously large number, ending with a very small number, which is not unusual uh, in, when we conduct these things. So this is the Covidence application. There's a lot of different uh, parts to it, but it really lets you control um, the settings of how you're going to review it, the reviewers, uh, you, you should be doing this in a team, there should be at least a couple reviewers, they can resolve conflicts, you can set it up in a, one organized uh, place, you can identify each of these criteria and uh, use this software to really help do it. It's a lot of work, it's generally not done in one sitting, so you need to have sort of good records of what was done by whom um, over time as you track it and organize it. And also for later for publication, you want to have that flow sheet of what happened to all the articles that you started with and why you ended up with the set that you did. So after you perform your search, you have to select the final studies and that is based on your inclusion criteria. You start with the title and abstract that you're focusing on sensitivity. You're casting a wide net. You don't wanna miss anything at that stage. You really wanna dig deep and see if you can find uh, all the appropriate articles. As you go into full text reviews, that's where you get a bit more specific and start excluding certain things that don't meet your initial set of criteria. 
And again, it's highly recommended to have at least a couple people do this um, to resolve any conflicts. Extracting the data is, is the, sort of the rote part of this, but even that can be done in a very systematic, uh, organized way. There's software to do that as well, RevMan, but it's basically a spreadsheet based on the data that you've chosen to extract. It's a good idea to do this for one or two studies, get a sense of what's available in the various studies so you can build out your spreadsheet and consistently apply that as you go through the future studies in your systematic uh, review. In terms of assessing the quality, there's also tools to do this, but we're looking for evaluating the risk of bias, um, the choice of outcome measures, the statistical issues, quality of reporting, and so on. So you, the Cochrane also has this risk of bias tool that you can use, go through each study, and they're looking at various things. For example, a randomized controlled trial, you're going to look at random sequence generation, whether they had allocation concealment, blinding of participants, blinding of outcome assessments, uh, and so on. And each of those categories will be assessed for each paper to give you an overall assessment of uh, quality for each of the papers that you're going to include in your review. So this is the flow sheet that uh, should be included in all publications and systematic reviews so the reader can really see your thinking and how you went through and how you ended up with the final set of studies. And this is really what's eliminating a lot of that bias we initially spoke of, like you took a systematic approach um, and didn't sort of cherry pick which studies to include to fit a particular narrative. We don't have time today, but the the PRISMA statement is ready, readily available online. Uh, this is what it kind of looks like from the very beginning, from the title through the introduction, methods, results, discussion. Uh, it tells you exactly what should be in, uh, should be reported and how it should be reported to be a high quality systematic review. And then we're looking to synthesize all that information now for the reader so they have something digestible like that was part of one of the goals um, you want to combine all the results and present the main finding if you have a homogeneous population you have a lot of papers that looked at uh, uh, things in a, in a very homogeneous way where that information you can combine that actual numerical numbers and a statistical approach, that's more of a meta-analysis. But even if you can't do that, your populations are a bit more heterogeneous or the methodology is a bit more heterogeneous, narrative or descriptive syntheses are still useful. It's still helpful to understand what were the range of results, for example, um, in a PRO or something after a particular technique, even in a descriptive fashion. And then finally, looking to publish your work, there are tools for that as well. You can put your title and your abstract um, in this publication sort of finder, journal finder, and it'll give you some suggestions about potential targets to uh, submit to. There are some limitations, of course. You know, it, it's only as good as what you include in it. So if there are issues with repeatability and bias uh, from the studies that are included, your systematic review will, can have the same issues. Small effects of interventions can be over magnified and very difficult to do with very scarce uh, topics, of course. And if it's not explicitly stated, it can be very difficult to reproduce uh, if that protocol is not noted. So we don't really understand the bias that was or was not eliminated, which is a major goal of this too. But the strengths are, are pretty significant. It's an ability to minimize that bias when properly done and that error, especially type two error. A lot of, of small studies may not have the power to detect a difference. And if you are able to collate that together, that's helpful and can overcome low powered studies. Uh, it's very transparent. It should be reproducible. Um, and it's often used for developing guidelines. Uh, so they, are, uh, they become very important. Uh, sources of our research. Thanks. That was, <clears throat> that was great, Uma. I mean, a lot of this is, I mean, for us, for those that don't or haven't necessarily been knee deep in performing these studies, it's very helpful in understanding the uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of what's required in order to actually do these. A lot of times when you read them, you're just like, oh, it's another systematic review or it's another meta-analysis. But understanding the actual involvement with regards to the research team and the the you know how much rigor needs to go into actually performing these, <clears throat> I think that alone helps uh, lay weight to um, uh, these types of studies. 
Um, I I had a couple questions and then I'll open it up to everyone else because I know this is this is a topic of a big in, interest for me and, and as others. Um, from your standpoint, um, uh, uh, two questions. One is from your standpoint, having done a lot of these, is it easy for you to, to recognize or not recognize a well-performed systematic review or meta-analysis uh, when you're reading the literature? And do you think that in general journals do either a, a good or bad job at being able to identify that? And then the, the second um, uh, question that I have for you is that um, a lot of systematic reviews will come back as uh, inconclusive, you know, that that's, that's the end of uh, finding, which sometimes is, it's a little bit frustrating when we read them. And it can honestly be, um, it's almost like we don't want to read any more of them because they all come back as inconclusive. And so how do you kind of uh, mitigate that when you're attempting to perform these so that at least we come up with some reasonable conclusions with regards to the data and um, we can then um, so that they're, they're, the, the studies are meaningful. Yeah, thanks. I mean, a couple tough questions. Um, in terms of identifying them, I think that Prisma statement's been really helpful. So even back in 2013, when they we looked at the sort of quality existing in orthopedics of systematic reviews, it wasn't terrible. I mean, it was already a lot of the journals were around two thirds to three quarters of that Prisma statement you know, achieving the, that goal. So I think it's better now as a awareness of that exists and all those, I, I wanted to convey that there are a lot of tools out there now that really help you do this, that are online, that are software-based, as well as people, librarians and statisticians. So this is not something to embark upon, you know, alone or with a small group. It takes, you know, we're orthopedic surgeons. It's not our area of expertise to know how to, you know, find the appropriate databases or even be aware of all the databases. Like it's such an exponential growth of information and misinformation uh, in today's world. So gathering uh, your team and your infrastructure, I think is the first step. And, you know, we've agreed upon this Prisma statement with this checklist. So I think both the authors as well as the journals can, you know, look to that as sort of a, a guide and, uh, you know, a way to a checklist to make sure at least some basic things are included. But I think uh, as a, on the reviewer side, it's okay to challenge people about their inclusion and exclusion criteria and ask why certain studies were and weren't included. And then the quality assessment is the final piece in that even that risk assess risk of bias tool. You can even argue in some of the analysis, if the risk of bias was so high, that can be one of your exclusion criteria. Sure. So you wanted to include it, but after your risk of assess, uh, bias assessment was done, it was just so poor that it would it would uh, really alter the results. And I think anytime you take heterogeneous populations, right, um, and try to group them together, you're going to be predisposed to the null hypothesis, suggesting there's no difference. Because, you know, there's, you're just taking different patient populations and things. Like if you take proximal humerus fractures and you combine 30 and 40 year olds who had a high trauma event and combine that with 80 year olds that have a low energy four part pro I mean, we're just talking about two different populations. But if you pool that data in a meta analysis, you're likely to find there, you know, for surgical intervention, there's going to be no difference but that's not very relevant. We don't operate on the average patient or a mix of a high young patient and an old um, sure. low energy patient. So that's the risk. I mean, you want to define your population appropriately that you do a systematic review of just 40 to 50 year olds with four part proximal humerus fractures with this technology, how did they do? Um, so we can have something more clinically uh, applicable. And maybe that's, that probably answers partly the second question, is that maybe some of the reasons why we are seeing that some of these systematic reviews that really don't necessarily show that they're inconclusive with regards to findings, it may be less the study design, but rather how the inclusion exclusion criteria that was used when they actually set up the study. Um, Bill, you have a question? Comment on that, Bob. Uh, 
if you look at the papers that we get, the higher level of evidence uh, papers invariably tend to have less definitive conclusions. When we start comparing things with level one and two, it, if you look at it, level four studies are invariably positive. You, you almost never see somebody submit a paper that said, we did 55 of these last year and 53 of them are doing terribly and the other two have already you know, won a lawsuit. Sure. I'm sorry, the higher level evidence you get, the more likely it is that you're going to um, come up with neutral conclusions. And that might be another reason. Um, maybe it's not less the poor, you know, study design inclusion exclusion, but maybe it's also com uh, combined with the actual studies that are being um, uh, that are being included. It's um, um, I don't know. I I cut you off there, Uma. But uh, what's your thoughts with regards to the um, kind of inconclusive findings with regards to either meta analyses or systematic reviews? Yeah, I think it, uh, what we discussed that point comes into play, and, and what Bill mentioned. I mean, some of these issues, you know, the original describers or maybe the folks that described that technique or invented something, and you know, they're doing the case series initially, and they have a certain set of outcomes, and then, you know, reproducibility is a significant problem in not just orthopedics but science in general. So there's various reasons for that, and uh, but that's why the these systematic reviews are important if you do have something that's reproducible, even from all over different parts of the world or different parts of the country that are all telling us the same thing, you can be a little bit more reassured of that conclusion. Um, I think it is, you know, we do have a lot of uh, techniques or, you know, implants that do end up giving us the same results. And yep. maybe we need to appreciate that and accept that as that is a that is truth you know as there is no difference in a lot of these things despite us or industry or someone wanting there to be a difference you know it's not saying that we shouldn't look or we can't try to improve on things but some of these things do have ceiling effects whether it's a pro measure uh, and in, in terms of that so i think a lot of those different issues come into play i think that's why some of this large database research is important too because a lot of the literature does come from maybe an expert center, not necessarily academic, but a private center that does a high volume of these from a single one or two high volume surgeons. And that gives you one result. But what happens when that technology or technique is extrapolated to the general population of orthopedic surgeons? And you know that's where you can't hide in a large claims database. All that is out there. You can't cherry pick the data from just the high volume surgeons and then report on that. So it's sort of the difference between efficacy, sort of a lab environment, a perfect environment, and effectiveness, which is a societal or real world uh, environment. Yep. All right, great. I think we're going to move on to Chris. That's uh, great comments. One quick five second, Uma. What's the best next systematic review that should be done in shoulder surgery? Give me your one-liner. I would love to know about uh, lower trapezius tendon transfers. You know. Yeah. Okay. I'm good. That's was on the top of my list as things that, but uh, I think it's a great topic. All right. Next, we're gonna have uh, Chris Clifto. He's gonna talk about how to effectively navigate large uh, database studies to produce high quality research. It was a great transition from what Uma had been discussing into this next topic. Uh, you're up, Chris. All right, Bob, thank you. And thank you so much for having me, Uma. That was a, that was a wonderful talk. Um, I actually had a couple slides on systematic reviews and why I think they're important. I actually just delete them because there's nothing I can actually add. So um, my first few slides are actually in rebuttal to, to Dr. Mallon, a, a plea from my residents about why we should be publishing these studies. And um, actually, I thought I was going to go after Bill, and I, Bill was, is always a gentleman, and he sent me his slides before so I could prepare. And uh, it, one of the things that he had in his slides is, what should we publish? And I'm saying publish it all. Thank you very much. End of discussion. But uh, Bill's going to probably talk about why we shouldn't do that. And these are actually made by my residents for Bill about why we should publish more systematic reviews, more large database evidence. All the AOS clinical guidelines are from large database studies and systematic reviews. And you can see this is actually for rotary cuff. And the first line is based on systematic reviews of published studies. Number two, 
most read articles in the last 30 days, you can see a lot of them are systematic reviews and large database studies. Most cited articles in the last three days from our own beloved editor from the journal Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, a lot of them are systematic reviews and large database studies. And even JBJS came out with a recent uh, article purely based on large database studies. So, you know, contact me if you don't have this article or these articles or this um, uh, journal, this uh, edition. It's awesome. It's everything you need to know for large database studies, and I highly recommend going through it. Um, our, my journey started with large database and uh, these three different types of databases, whether it's EMR-based data, pool data, or national databases, because when I first started in practice, I didn't have PROs, and my colleagues wouldn't let me look at their PROs. They said I had to earn them myself, and get them myself and couldn't have theirs. And I had to figure out another way to do research, not the great ones in ASCS, but some of my other ones. So we thought, hey, what are different ways that we can start? And we actually start with EMR-based data and national databases, which I'm gonna kind of go over our, our pathway and how we did it. But the idea we're like, okay, we have to figure out what, how to get to that next step and really change the game. And one of our people that we really look up to is Billy Bean and we kind of, look, we only look like the guy on the left. We, we want to look like the guy on the right, but we're like, Billy Bean is who we want to be in orthopedics, especially shoulder and elbow surgery. So how do you start if you're interested in your EMR? And EMR is your local institution. Um, the way you start is actually, you, you go to your data strategy engineer. And if you're at a big healthcare system, most places have a strategy engineer that can actually help you with uh, queries. And we just did a quick search around our area. And we found this person who actually pulls queries from Epic and we had them make, make this thing called retrieval syntax, which pulls automated data um, in a way that allowed us to mine it. And it was quite a simple thing to do and, and most places have it. But then on top of that, any of these people can also program ways to do free text search. So what does that mean? That means that you can pull data from anything you really want from your local EMR but then most places have a free text option where you could pull information in an automated fashion from your op notes or your click notes to give you kind of a complete data set. So that was a game changer for us. And the answer is what can be pulled? Really anything. And for the EMR based data that we start with CPT codes, but then we looked at things that we thought were important, which would be length of stay, discharge, location, payer mix. And then we looked at comorbidity variables, which we thought would be important as well. And uh, Uma talked about this a little bit, but the benefits of EMR data and large database research is the accuracy usually exceeds national databases because it's your local uh, institution. You're able, to re uh, re you're able to evaluate rare events, which are usually defined by less than 5%. And the initial data pool usually is questions that produce sub cohorts that lead to more narrow questions. And that happened with us and I'll kind of show you our pathway. And I see Howard Routman's on here, who's done a lot of this from industry perspectives too, which would be interesting to hear his perspective. So the limitations with our EMR based data, well, the patient follow-up is really inconsistent. And what does that mean? That means that, you know, the large national databases, and we'll go over that at the end of this talk, but like they follow patients based on sometimes their payer mix or, or it, how they're captured by the large database, the EMR-based data isn't. So if you have a patient that gets treated at Duke or Hopkins or Utah, and they go to one of your local healthcare systems, you totally lose them in your EMR-based data. It doesn't pick that up. PROs are actually extremely challenging to, uh, to, to capture with the system and extract. That's the one thing we found that was challenging. We're trying to work on that. And then high volume systems produce the most data. So if you're in a lower volume system, you may have a little bit less of an opportunity to actually collect meaningful data this way. So what did we do? And, and you're gonna see some of the studies in our pathways that we did. We, we focused on predictive modeling techniques. And for those of you that, we're, this is gonna stay high level, but they're multivariable logistic regre regressions. And what that does is it tells you this likelihood of an interaction of multiple variables working synergistically and independently to produce, produce the, the value you're trying to get. And we use this thing called the area under the receiver operator characteristic for internal validation to see, is our model um, performing the way we think it should? And then the next step in what we're doing right now is we're combining that with deep learning and machine learning principles to be able to take those predictive models and those principles that we're trying to come up with and combine them with things that historically wouldn't be able to do, like radiology reads, what are MRI findings, things that will hopefully make it more applicable to, to actual patients. 
So we start out with, you know, what, what do we care most about and what do we think these large databases can accomplish? And we thought that that would initially be value-based care environments. And you're going to see when we talk about the large databases, that's really why large databases were started. So we thought about outpatient appropriateness for shoulder arthroplasty, and that's important to institutions because cost savings. 90-day readmissions because that's penalized by CMS. Discharge to subacute uh, rehabs because that's one of the big primary drivers for excess costs. And extended inpatient length of stay, which is considered to potentially be an adverse event itself. So we developed these risk prediction tools based on that and based on kind of the principles we talked about. So what did we do? We thought that Duke wasn't probably the only place that we could do this because it was too homogeneous. We had to partner with another institution Institution, which was Rush, because um, we thought that would be a different paramix, a different population. It actually proved to be extremely different, which improved our statistics when we ran them together. And it was a two instant shoulder arthroplasty cohort that had about 6,000 uh, shoulder arthroplasties, uh, which was really good for our data. And then we started to work on predictive modeling. So then, when, if, if you're going to do this, the next step is to build your, your um, variables that you're going to analyze. And these on the right were what we actually pulled with our data scientists and um, which we studied to run the, the regressions. It, it was helpful. And you could do this with your institution as well uh, to, to study whatever you want. So the first study that we actually did was, like we talked about, the characteristics and risk factors of 90 readmissions firing shoulder arthroplasty. And this was with our 5,000 arthroplasties. And then we decided, okay, that, that was like a nice descriptive uh, study and it gave some good data, but like that's only step one. Step two is let's develop a predictive model that will give discharge to skilled nursing rehabilitation uh, facility following anatomic reverse shoulder arthroplasty to try to actually make this large data accessible to other people. And then we decided to do the same thing for a validated um, risk pr a prediction score for extended inpatient left of stay. Again, things that we thought that that insurance companies would care about and what view our readers would actually care about from JSCS. And then again, if you look at our data, we wanted to look to see, you know, what's our outpatient appropriateness? One of the hot topics that, you know, Quinn and, and uh, Howard were working on were you know, outpatient appropriateness for same day discharge. So we did the same thing. We took that same large EMR database, took all that data and built a, a we built a tool to say, which patients, um, are okay for short inpatient length of stay, and specifically ones that didn't have a nine-day readmission because that's what Medicare cared most about. Um, and, you know, it was actually, you know, Bill made it the JSCS editor's pick of 2022, which was um, very kind of him. And then again, we keep moving down the different uh, avenues, but this all started with us developing this EMR-based database, which all of you can do, which was pretty easy to do, to be honest with you. And then, you know, other, other institutions, um, are now looking at the, the different prediction tools that we have uh, created and they're validating themselves, which has been a lot of fun to see how uh, our work is um, proving in other institutions. Um, and again, everything you're doing is trying to get an AUC of around at least 0.7, right? If you're above 0.7, then you have a pretty accurate predictive model. But if you're closer to one, then you have a perfect predictive model. But we always shoot for something about 0.7 because that's probably something good enough for it to impact patients and physicians as far as their decision making. So that was so that's step one for our EMR database. And then step two is actually moving to what I talked about would be the machine learning. And, and that's you know what we're working on using these large databases to see, can you use AI machine learning to actually give us better outcomes, better knowledge for our patients and, our, and, and other physicians to use. But, you know, as you all know, no clinical tool, especially EMR, can actually substitute for knowing the patient and patient experience and surgeon experience. And we, we fully understand that, but this is step one in what we like to do for identifying at-risk patients to optimize them, to set us up for the best possible outcomes. So part two of this talk is, because I deleted all the systematic review stuff because we did so well, is the large volume databases. and. Um, yeah, I thought the, the best thing for this talk would actually be just to kind of give an overview of the big ones. From a from our perspective, we've done a few studies early on with this. Um, and we had at our institution people who were actually hired or have multiple roles in all these different databases who were liaisons to help us with this. And most of these databases have that. So you can either learn it yourself. One of my residents um, who's actually going to shoulder and elbow at, uh, at uh, WashU next year um, taught himself how to use Pearl Diver. It's actually kind of easy to do. You could do online courses. And if you if you paid for it, then you could, you could actually do it well. 
But um, large volume databases were created to assess preoperative complications, costs, and resource consumption. And this actually started from the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, where they found that it, where, where it, this was an act that wanted to show that institutions are accountable for patient outcomes and surgeon performance should be monitored through quality measures. So that's how these large volume databases were created. Um, and this actually became more recently available with big data accrual technology, like I talked about from our EMR data. And this happened somewhere around the mid, the mid 90s to early 2000s. Um, but the origins of big data were derived from the vesting interests of quantifying the risks and benefits of procedures. And this gave implications to pay and performance models, which we're seeing right now. But specifically, it was also developed to actually look out for rare diseases, which um, it's actually been this most useful um, reason to use. And, um, you know, you could use it for many things. All of them have some sort of variation of region, gender, age, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, comorbidities, insurance type, institution types. But each individual uh, database has a little bit different nuances. And if you're going to go ahead and actually start using these large databases, do yourself a favor, look at the databases of what you're actually hoping to achieve first before you actually spend the fees to use it. Um, there are two main types of these large databases. One is an administrative database and the other is a clinical database. The administrative databases are usually from billing data. They're not as applicable to surgeons doing research. They're more for payments, healthcare payments and claims. The ones we all use are defined as clinical databases and they're defined from a given patient population and there's, they're designed to record and track information, again, to answer specific questions or to improve actually quality. So one of the first ones out there was actually the NIS uh, database. And this was, again, part of the Health and Cost Utilization Project, which is actually a federally mandated um, large database for outcomes. Um, it's the largest of all payer inpatient databases in the world. So if you need big, big data, NIS is your way to go. It has over 8 million discharges per year. And interestingly, they take, they take more than that and they stratify these people and randomize them by 20% to kind of take out outliers and not make it like a, a, a non induced uh, variance. They just want to have randomization. So it produces 100 data points, a lot of them which we talked about, but it's all based on ICD-9 and 10 codes. And one of the best things about NIS, if you're going to try and get started on this, this may be a good one because unless your institution is going to pay for it, the subscription fee can be quite small. It can be $500, which is actually one of the lowest on the market. And that changes, but that's great. Negatives of this, if you're going to use it, only inpatient encounters are used. It doesn't allow for longitudinal tracking. So if you want to see patients on an outpatient basis or how they do with PT, it's not going to track that at all. Yeah, it, it, it's been considered to underestimate complication rates for whatever reason. That's just been one of the critiques of it. It only contains pre-discharge comorbidities. And the reason why that's challenging is because if you're trying to track post-operative complications, this data, this data set struggles if you're trying to do that. So it confuses the two. So if you're looking at complications, this is not your um, data set you wanna use. And it does not contain operative variables. So for surgeons, maybe not as great. This is another good one that we use often, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And this is one of the big ones we use for surgical research. This is different than the NIS database. It allows for logical tracking of patients through various phases of healthcare, which is great because it's tracking Medicare and Medicaid. So anytime one of those patients uses one of those services, whether it's PT, your outpatient visit, it's going to track it. So it also allows different than NIS, NIS database for your pre and post hour of comorbidities and complications. And one of the unique things about this one and where it really shines is for whatever reason, they figure out ways to link to other databases. And that's kind of outside the scope of this, but it just increases the numbers and actually gives you different um, uh, uh, different databases to use along with Medicare and Medicaid. Negatives with this one, if you're looking for young patients, Medicare and Medicaid services is not the way to go. And it's only data from billable events. So this doesn't track your institutional data that's not billed. This is only if you get billed through Medicare and Medicaid. And it's extremely expensive. Like some of these cost over $2,000, depending on where you are, what your institution is. Private databases recently have become extremely um, prominent. And I could say that we've moved to Pearl Diver over all the others. Um, and the reason is just because the numbers are so big. It's Believe it or not, these are private for-profit databases. And the ones that we typically use are Pearl Diver and Market Scam. And um, it's variable because the different sources come from the payer. But this is also why 
it's uh, useful because it's not just Medicare, it's not just Medicaid, but it's the entire payer service that these Pearl Divers and Market Scans has subscribed to. Pearl Diver is the one we use the most when it's mainly because there's over 4 billion, billion patient records with Humana, United Healthcare, and Medicare, which it pulls into one big database. And where Pearl Diver shines, where we found, has been cost data. And honestly, it's been opioid data. You could track individual prescriptions for patients. And we've done a lot of studies looking on ways to decrease opioid use and that being a metric for quality for these large databases, which is great. Market scan is the second most common one of the private payer. It's an administrative database that uh, looks at claims and enrollment data actually from employers. So it's different. Um, it's the problem is that one's also expensive, but they both allow for assessment for pre and post operative comorbidities and complications. The market scans on the higher side, Pearl Diver is variable depending on what your institution is, but these range from 5,000 to 500,000. So that could be quite a, a taxing sum uh, for this data, especially if Bill refuses to publish them. Um, lastly, we're going to talk about the NISQIP data, and this is actually more of a historical one. We don't use it as much, but um, it was actually developed by the VA because they found that they weren't tracking their patient outcomes and they didn't have a way to do it. And when they started tra tracing their patient outcomes, they found that their complication rates went down. So they started the VA SQIP, which was a, a database specifically for the vets, and that morphed into the NISQIP, which was actually adopted by the American College of Surgeons in response to the VA system. And, you know, this is mainly for trauma procedures, but it's adapted, it's moved to elective and, and, um, and emergent procedures. Um, it's based in the US and one of the benefits of this one actually has international data points as well. Um, and the reason why this database is more accurate than others, and that's one of the benefits is that it, they actually employ nurse reviewers to actually look at every one of the data points, which the other ones don't do. And they have a huge number of data points. So um, over 135. The biggest limitation with this one is that it only tracks for 30 days, but it is one considered to be one of the most precise and accurate databases of them all. But again, really expensive. The cost could be over 100K. So that's kind of the big summary of um, EMR-based data and, and the large-scale databases. And I kind of hope that was helpful. Perfect. <clears throat> Chris, great job. I know a lot of kind of area to uh, go over. And I think it um, covers really the two big areas, which is, you know, EMR-based and the, and the uh, pay, pay large database, um, uh, 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 large databases that are out there. Um, I guess um, it'll be it'll be interesting to actually get Bill's point of view a little bit with regards to what his thoughts on um, the Pearl Diver market stand type studies, but I'm not going to steal his thunder from his talk because I'm sure it's going to be in there. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I <clears throat> struggle myself with is not necessarily sitting from the editorial reviewer role with regards to should I or should I not accept the paper or what should I say with regards to reviews, et cetera. But more is from a clinical side of how should I use this information on a day-to-day -day basis? And I'll, I'll even bring it back to like the studies that you guys published with regards to 90-day complication rates and risks for um, uh, readmission uh, or um, uh, you know, length of stay, et cetera. In, in terms of risk calculators that are that are created, I'm gonna be honest, I don't use those risk calculators, me personally, on a day-to-day -day basis in my clinic. And um, I, you know, I don't know why, maybe I'm doing a bad job treating my patients that I should be doing using that to better, more effectively treat them. Um, I think COVID actually did it something interesting in that um, everyone almost got outpatient surgery if they could physically get outpatient surgery. And I noticed that my numbers of complications didn't necessarily, uh, you know, uh, you know, escalate in a, you know, uh, exponential fashion. So it's like almost I'll offer it if people want it. And so it would be interesting to get your thoughts of how you've instituted those uh, risk calculators and the, all the information that you've been able to push out into your own clinical practice and how might be a way for us to better have educate surgeons to be able to actually do that on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, that's a really good point because all these studies were made kind of pre-COVID. And um, we've, you know, 
uh, Mur Murthy did a really good job with like looking at independently our risk prediction prediction calculators and like did it work or did it not work and his institution found you know it wasn't as accurate as we thought it was from our institutions and you know that's that's the cool thing about these studies is that that was the first attempt at it and as we get better and we get more refined with our statistics and our increase our numbers and as more of these um, patients get put into our risk calculator because as the risk calculator gets more patients it gets smarter we're going to be more refined but the answer to your question is yeah no it's it's kind of like big picture stuff like chronic kidney disease like that isn't one that does well with an outpatient surgery do they have good home help like that is we've been finding actually with our new stuff that is number one like if they don't have good home help they're going to get readmitted right away and it was just kind of a good way to look at what are the big ticket items to look out for in your clinic to check off as we refine our, our parameters? Sure. Uma, have you been able, have you been instituting these into your clinical practice or how, how have you, I mean, you've, you've read all this data. What's, what's your take in terms of how you've been able to use it in, in taking care of your own patients? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think it's difficult to use day to day, you know, uh, in the clinic, but with the increasing sophistication of the EMRs, like this can, you know, be done automatically, you know, if these calculators are built within it. And so with very little burden, I think that's the main reason most of us wouldn't use it. We don't, it's not that we don't think it's valuable. It's just burdensome to manually have to calculate something. But I think the other big area, I mean, I don't think it, we're meant to calculate a risk and then tell someone that they can't have surgery most of the time, right? even if you double the risk of infection, it's so low, like going from 0.25 to 0.5 infection rate is not prohibitive for that patient, whether you're talking about obesity or something like that. So really, we may maybe we shouldn't be using it. Like you get into some ethical concerns about uh, access of care and, and so on. But I think it's very useful uh, in the quality realm. Like if you're just trying to assess quality in your own department across your group of surgeons, you can't do that without adequate risk adjustment. And our risk adjustment now is really poor. You know, sure. we don't understand all the variables. So this large database research is extremely valuable just for that. If you want to just measure your group's infection rates, you really have to understand all the different factors that your different faculty members or par practice partners uh, and that patient population that they take care of. Just being in a slightly different geographic area, your two two different surgeons can have two different results. And you know that's not a very good quality metric unless you've adequately um, risk adjusted for it. And I think we're still way behind that. We're way behind where we wanna be in terms of how we wanna measure quality. We haven't really figured out all the risk issues uh, to adjust it to fairly you know, monitor our progress as surgeons. You know, it would be interesting from a, from a society standpoint to be able to somewhat put together a way, an easy access way for surgeons on a day-to-day -day basis that ASCS could somehow cull together the various kind of risk adju adjustment tools that are available to synthesize it, to make it like a single stop on a website page where you could potentially um use it for a patient that you're going to perform shoulder surgery on. And it, as opposed to pulling in various things from various articles, et cetera, it may be an interesting um, uh, idea to be able to use the society to be able to, 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 to pull that information together to make it a, a more realistic tool on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, anyways, uh, great talk, Chris. I think we'll... Um, move to uh, Bill, which uh, again, uh, really uh, thankful Bill is here. It, it will kind of shape uh, both of these last two talks. Um, Bill um, has obviously had a long tenure now, uh, I think 10 years, right, Bill, as editor? Or longer? 16. 16 years, 16 years, and coming to an end uh, soon. But um, He's going to talk about how to how uh, to determine big data what big data studies should be published in shoulder surgery. So hopefully we'll will put put some bookends on to the to the last two topics. Thanks, Bill. Okay, Bob. Thanks for uh, having me. And um, Chris Chris said that he thought he was uh, sort of debating against me, and uh, he'll probably win that. But at least I don't have a typo on my on my uh, title slide. So hopefully I can uh, get this. I prepared a summary slide. 
which Chris also stole from me in case we ran out of time. So the answer to this is I really don't know the answer to this. And thank you very much. We're done. So if you have to go, that's my summary slide. So here's my disclaimers. So I'm really going to be talking more about what Chris talked about than what Uma did uh, with what I call big data, which is I, I term them database mining studies. And Bob, I don't know what you get now at JBJS, but I would say 25 to 30 percent of the articles that we get submitted to JSCS are either systematic reviews or database mining studies anymore because they're just proliferating. So what is big data? Uh, well, one definition is too, it's data that's too big to be used by uh, uh, commonly used software like Excel. And we don't see much of that because most of the stuff we do is going to be used by Excel, but there's things like Hadoop and Ap Apache Spark. And of course, now all the various machine learning tools like ChatGPT and things like that are, are coming around. Um, this started around 2002, and a, a more detailed definition of it is that it's information with high, velo high volume, high velocity, and variety that requires specific technology to be able to be used. And that's the three big V's of how they define big data anymore, velocity, volume, and variability in the data. And it's considered to span the entire health industry's uh, uh, universe of data. And it's proliferating and doubling. Here's uh, one slide of it, and it's not a very good slide, but you can kind of get the picture of how it's going up now in the last decade or so, um, sort of exponentially at this point. Um, there's a pretty good article on this, Big Data in Healthcare Management Analysis and the Future Prospects. And this actually came out of the Journal of Big Data. And yes, there is such a journal in case you uh, don't subscribe to it yet, but uh, that, that journal is out there. And, you know, what are the various types of big data? Well, mostly, uh, you know, Chris talked about EMRs and we, we deal with that. Uh, wearable medical devices, I think are gonna become big things in orthopedics. In biometrics, uh, exercise tolerance may be good for orthopedics. Neural activity, it won't be EEGs, but it may be EMGs and nerve conduction studies that we'll use and compile this from various sources uh, using a lot of wearable devices that I'll talk about later. And Chris talked about the various places these things came from. Uh, the Pearl Diver Database, the Nesquip Database, the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, the Premier Database, which we don't see much of uh, at JSCS, the National Inpatient Sample, Chris also mentioned. There's also uh, state registries and databases. New York has the biggest one, I think, that's called Sparks, but there's other states that have similar registries. I think California has one. And of course, now we have registries uh, in many countries. Uh, the United States was one of the late ones. Uh, Scandinavia and the Netherlands were well ahead of us, um, but now we have the AOS shoulder and elbow registry. Arthrex, as you know, using REDCap has its own uh, registry that it's developed um, and it's proprietary. And then we talk about EMR data that Chris also mentioned, especially in large groups like Kaiser and outside of uh, orthopedics, there's Cancer Centers of America, which compile large amounts of data from all over the place. You know, Ron Navarro and his group in, in Kaiser in California is coming up with all sorts of stuff from their massive uh, EMRs they have. And there's problems with all of these that Chris went over some of them. Uh, they're all sort of proprietary to different degrees. Pearl Diver is expensive, um, but major centers like a Duke or uh, Johns Hopkins can certainly get access to it. Uh, NISQIP, uh, it's also mentioned it's limited uh, to hospitals and it only has 30 day follow up for uh, complications. Sparks, the New York State uh, uh, registry is not de identified. So that's a problem, certainly. And I'll talk more about this when I come into the pros and cons of this thing. So in, in terms of what we publish and when I think we should use big data, and, and, and Chris kind of, I'm not against big data at all. I just think uh, it, it has to be uh, uh, used a little more carefully sometimes. I think it has to answer research questions we can't answer with small data. And the question really to pose that Uma talked about what is the best way to answer the research question? And that's probably the best answer to the topic that Bob assigned me. If it's big data, use it. If it's a, a randomized clinical trial, use that. Um, you know, one of the problems that in systematic reviews that uh, Uma mentioned, he said the top of the pyramid 
is a systematic review or meta-analysis. Well, it, it is and it isn't. Uh, the problem in orthopedics is the, the top of the pyramid is a systematic review of level one data. We don't have a lot of level one data in orthopedics. So we have very few, very rarely do we have a systematic review of level one data. Um, so what are the pros of it? Uh, well, it's easy. I mean, anybody who got access to Pearl Diver or NIST Quip or all that, if, if they're any good at Excel, um, there's a guy, there's a resident at Duke now who tremendous at this. He can probably write one article a day. And, and you know, that's why Chris actually doesn't have to work anymore. He just sits back and let, lets Owen do the work for him. But, and again, there's other residents and fellows at many places that specialize in this. But one of my favorite quotes from Einstein, uh, Kevin Bozick always criticizes me and says, I put too many Einstein quotes in, but he said, I have little patience with scientists who take a board of wood, look for its thinnest parts, and then drill holes wherever drilling is easy. And to me, that's sort of what people are doing sometimes with uh, using big data and pearl diver and things like that. It's easy. I mean, it's much easier than doing a clinical trial, um, but it's perfect to answer rare problems. I think the best uh, use of it right now is, you know, prosthetic joint infection, PJI. Um, we've got all sorts of data now showing that, uh, you know, um, uh, the acne medicine, I'm blanking on it here. Uh, um, you know, hydrogen peroxide, it, it evolves into, it lowers the quantity of C acnes on the skin, but we don't have the data that shows that it actually decreases infection yet because infections are so rare. As Uma pointed out, it's you know 0.25% to 3% for total shoulders. And the 3% was re reverse arthroplasties in the early years. It's probably more like, Oh, it's probably more like 0.25% to 1% now. So you need a, a big data study to get that much stuff for prosthetic joint infection. We're looking at quadrilateral space syndrome. I mean, that's real, it exists, but I did almost nothing but shoulders for 25 years and I operated twice on a quadrilateral space syndrome. So, you know, nobody sees that. I mean, I can't write a paper about that. Congenital you know, clavicular pseudarthrosis, rare tumors around the shoulder. You know, there's really no way to study those except for minimal level four data or level five. So that's perfect for uh, using big data. The other thing is the insurance companies, the government and the pharmaceutical companies, they're gonna demand this. And um, I remember Kevin Bozick saying one time talking about EMRs and, and data, if you're not you know, at the table, you're on the table. Um, so we're going to have to use this. We're going to, you know, uh, be forced to. And artificial intelligence is going to answer questions with the big data we can't answer any other way. I think it's really going to be prominent with genomics. You know, probably the best guy to talk about this in this panel is Bob Tajan, who is uh, really, along with Andy Carr and Salma Jaduri, has sort of pioneered uh, genomic studies of the rotator cuff. Um, but that's going to be huge in the next uh, coming years and decades. The National Institutes of Health recently instituted in all of us our initiative <clears throat> that aims to collect over 1 million or more patient data from EMRs and all other places, and they're demanding that we use big data. And here's what they, the government thinks that we can get out of big data, which is sort of almost everything. Um, and the one I love is it's going to prevent human error. Um, I'm still not certain anything's going to prevent human error because we're human, but uh, they think it can do almost everything. So what are the bad things about big data? Well, by the computer term, GIGO, it's garbage in, garbage out. I mean, how good is the data that's in Pearl Diver or NISQIP or Premier? Um, who's input inputting the data and how accurate it is? I'm kind of a math nerd, and uh, it may not matter how good the data is, to be honest. Uh, if you use things like central limit theory and the law of large numbers, which basically says if you get large enough numbers, everything, you know, eventually sort of goes to a normal distribution. So it may not be so important. And the other cons is what we talked about, the follow-up being so short for Pearl Diver and NISQIP and things like that. And that may not be a problem for a lot of orthopedic scenarios, but for things like total joints and tumors, it is. Uh, also, some of these things uh, are de-identified, and um, how well can you follow the patient longitudinally? Chris talked about in some of them, there's really no longitudinal follow-up, so that's hard. 
The other thing is that most of the databases use, you know, ICD and CPT, CPT codes, and that may not and, uh, really accurately reflect the surgery you performed. A good example of this was until a couple of years ago, there was no differential between an anatomic and a reverse total shoulder uh, in CPT codes. So uh, those databases don't really tell you the difference between them. The other thing is almost all of this data is level four, whether you um, think it is or not. And this is gonna be subject to selection bias since the research question is always asked, is almost never asked rather before you collect the data. So just a word um, on, again, what are the bad things about it? The government has pointed out and other media has pointed out um, there's problems in it that are sort of out of society's grasp of international laws, who owns the data, security concerns. And this is kind of slowing us down from using some of this big data and really uh, getting into machine learning to access these databases. So uh, the machine learning things, neural networks, they, they're really uh, great. I mean, they're gonna do things we don't even know about yet. And they have amazing potential to both be good and bad. The problem, I see at the journal, and I don't know about you, Bob, maybe we can uh, discuss this. When I receive these articles, I really don't know what's going on under the hood. I can't see how they function or how they learn on their own. So I don't really know what they're doing. They come up with a conclusion. It's like, okay, great. What did you do? How did you figure that out? But the insurance companies want it. The government payers want it. So we're going to have to do it. And we may never know what the algorithm is. And for the insurance companies and the government, they can set these algorithms up to do whatever they want it to be and to make the results come out however they want to. So we have to be careful about that. So again, we have to be at the table rather than on the table. We need to do it before they do. Again, I think uh, wearable devices are gonna be huge to generate huge amounts of big data. Our therapists can put them on our patients and see what range of motions are in certain disease processes and things like that. Um, we can um, also do strength studies in the lab, especially with athletes, you know, for activities, daily living, pathologic conditions and things like that. And again, Bob, as I mentioned, genomics is gonna be huge. So in summary, I don't really know exactly what to publish, but the best current answer for big data is to answer questions we can't answer other ways. It's not as good as randomized clinical trials, in my opinion, but those are difficult to do and they take a long time. Um, so we're gonna have to get used to it and we're gonna have to use it uh, to answer clinical questions. You know, one of the concerns that we have about it that Jed Kuhn and I pointed out in the editorial, 10 years from now, if 30 to 40% of the stuff we receive is systematic reviews or database mining, where are the level one and level two and other studies gonna come from to do systematic reviews in 10 years. You know, we won't have anything. You'll have to do um, what are called umbrella reviews, which is systematic reviews of systematic reviews, which is another, you know, big topic. Um, so I think they're really important. Uh, we're gonna have to use them. Uh, there's good and bad with them. And again, I think the most important answer to the question is, it needs to uh, answer a question you can't answer in other ways is the best use of it. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Um, <clears throat> that was perfect. Um, very insightful. And I think it, honestly, it really, you answered the question that I asked, which I appreciate. That's great. Uh, sometimes, believe me, you, you give someone a topic and half the time, as you know, half the time, it, not, a, not only do they not answer the topic, I'm not even sure that they answer a different topic. So it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's refreshing to actually have you, um, uh, do that because it it honestly gives us direction. And I think that's important. Um, when people are d deciding research to perform, you know, again, uh, how do you go about it? What's the direction that you want to take? Um, there are a lot of different resources. And, um, you know, I, I, I think a little bit of like, um, um, uh, research is it's it's like capitalism a little bit in a sense that um you know you, you're not going to a, a lot of times you're not going to do anything unless you get paid for it and the payoff in research is getting published um a lot of times for what we do and um um 
I think it's it's the journals, the various journals' responsibility to be able to set the restrictions with regards to what or does or doesn't get published. Then that will push research in different directions. Meaning, if there's a higher bar or threshold to publish certain types of research, it may push research into a different direction. Like what you said, performing. Um, more level one studies uh, that might be uh, more e or easier to, to actually get published. And so I think it's a, it's a balance that, but I think there is a responsibility on the journal side to be able to um, direct some of the research so we don't end up in a situation and, where, where we're doing and, systematic and reviews. You, systematic and reviews. Bob, you certainly know this because of your role at JBJS. You know, Chris pointed out that uh, systematic reviews and things like that were the most uh, read topics. I mean, we've known that for 15 years. Um, yeah. You know, Elsevier, I, I have meetings with Elsevier all the time. They taught me 15 years ago that uh, the way to increase your impact factor is to publish more systematic reviews. Um, and and the two things that will increase an impact factor are systematic reviews and basic science uh, more than anything else. Um, so, so we know they're read. And I love them. I mean, again, as Chris, as Uma pointed out, you know, there's 270,000 articles to read and 3,000 a day coming out. And if you can read a good systematic review, it's great. Yep, I agree. And that can be, it can be impactful for, to your practice because I think if it's done well and it's written well, it will actually force uh, or hopefully push the reader <laughs> to go back to the articles that were published to look at them. And so that would be my thrust with regards to how I've tried to um, push the way that some of the systematic reviews have been written is to do it in a framework that would then uh, uh, give, a, give enough teasers to the person that's reading it. They would have interest to go back and actually read the original articles that they're actually putting in there, which, you know, that's a huge value in itself for people to go back and actually read the literature at the most highly impactful pieces of literature. Yeah, I think Bob, also the uh, for systematic reviews from, I don't know how many people are in the first 10 years of their career, but like we have used that as a way to build our research platform here on top of the EMR stuff, because a lot of time you don't know what questions you don't know. And we're like, you know, you're talking about lower traps, like you do a systematic review, do a real good lit search, ask the question, and then that's how you start to build your, your prospective studies in your RCTs. And sure. it's a great tool from that as well. Um, I think, Bill, you also make a really good point that maybe the big data that is going to probably be the most impactful are the things that we really barely have publications on at this point. Like you said, wearables. Uh, like you said, some of the AI machine learning. Uh, you know, that's going to be, I think, uh, very um it's going to be impactful and um, as opposed to just kind of reworking the hamster wheel of, you know, let's look in a different database to look at the same question that was already answered in a different study using a different database. It's not really that impactful. Um, the, the thing about those studies that you mentioned, machine learning, wearables, et cetera, there's, there's a bigger threshold. There's a bigger hurdle. To be able to um, to get over to be able to reform those, so that's big data. Um, that's not easy. That's a that's hard big data to be able to actually do a study that's that's well performed. It is a different point that you make about then how do you actually analyze this? Um, I'll be interested in your uh, your how your approach to machine learning and AI at this point. We were on a, a webinar. A couple months ago with uh, Howard was on it, Routman, Joaquin, Sanchez, Sotelo, and we were actually talking about machine learning and this exact topic came up with regards to what's the best way to be able to navigate the, the problem of determining what is or is not appropriately done AI or machine learning um, studies, because we don't have experts, at least within our right. field. Uh, and that's what, the hardest thing. I'm sure it's hard for you too. I get a machine learning paper. I don't know who I can send it to to, to review it. Right. Um, there's I, I have about ten people that will do it, and and I can't overburden them. I can't send them every one of them. Yeah. Uh, I always send machine learning to our biostatistician that looks at it, um, thinking that they'll know more about this than we would, and I, I hope she does, and uh, she helps with that. Sometimes I review it myself because I've got a pretty good math background. 
Yeah. Um, but again, it, it's it's really a black box. I mean, as I said, it's it's all done under the hood, and we don't know exactly what they're doing. You know, as you know, the way machine learning is done, you give them a data set, and the machine learns from it itself. So you never really see how it did it until yeah. it reaches a conclusion at the end, and you're like, um, okay, how'd right. you get there? Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, so I, it was interesting. I I posed this question to one of my bioengineers. That's one of my you know, my faculty that I work with. And I said, I, I asked him, I was like, what do you think of this? And he's like, Bob, this is the same phenomena that occurred 20 years ago with FEA modeling. So if you look at FEA modeling back at the infancy of it, that no one knew, it was, there was only a very few people that knew, understood the mathematics that was surrounding right. this. And therefore, there was there was very limited people to be able to actually become to, that were experts in this. And so you had the same issue. And what he it, what he said was that if you look back on some of those papers that were done 15 or 20 years ago, and Peter could probably comment on this as well, that you'd say, oh, there's those methods are clearly flawed with regards to what was actually published, and that we would never do that again. And but in the publication of some of those articles, it was then able to establish certain individuals as experts to then be able to move the science forward to then be able to establish it where it is now. And I think that uh, for me, I agree. I'm How I'm approaching this is I'm going to do my best job to be able to get someone in the field that has information and science or uh, expertise knowledgeable enough to be able to review it but it is not going to be a rate limiting step for me to say that we shouldn't publish the work because I think the only way for us to be able to develop experts in the field is to be able to start to publishing some of their science. You know, it's kind of like all technology. If you think about it, you know, we all have our iPhones that can do anything. If you look back 30 years ago to that movie, Wall Street with Michael Douglas, remember the phone he had on the beach that was the size of a horse's leg? Sure. I mean, that's what we had for cell phones back then. I, I used to tell my partners when EMRs first came out and they were so horrible and so hard to use. I said, it's like Michael Douglas's cell phone. I guarantee it 10 to 15 years from now. You know, I have a theory about EMRs that Chris mentioned uh, about pulling data from pretext. I think structured databases and EMRs may go away in a few years and we'll go back to free text. Because Google can analyze free text with algorithms. Why can't we analyze uh, free text with algorithms and make it easier? We could go back to almost dictating again and getting the data in there. I don't think EMRs will completely go away, but I bet we'll go back to a lot more free text analyzing, like Chris said he was starting to do. I was really impressed by that, Chris, that uh, you guys are doing that. Because I, I think that may, we may retrogress into that. Um, Peter, any thoughts with regards to kind of where, uh, you know, machine learning AI is going to go um, and how um, uh, how we're going to be able to navigate that? Um, and maybe for for surgeons or, uh, uh, you know, scientists that are interested in performing that type of research, what are some strategies to be able to um, to move in that direction? It's very interesting. Thank you very much for the talks. Um, uh, it, it's definitely going forward. I don't think we can do anything about it. The question I always kind of think uh, myself is, where is the place of innovation with big data? Because big data pretty much take all the information and kind of statistically evaluate the optimal outcome. But where is the innovation? Something that would be automatically an outlier in the beginning. Is there a way how it will survive the big data? I think that's a great question. I don't know if anyone has thoughts. Um, uh, Uma, I'm up. Yeah, I'm gonna throw you the. I'm gonna throw you the hard one, Uma. You have the extra letters after your M P. So that's the reason why I'm gonna throw the throw you the that's hard. Because I'm not very bright. I have a lot of. Oh, well, I don't know about that. But I mean, I think. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of excellent points about stuff. But one thing we don't talk about a little bit is sort of value based research. I mean, it's. Of course, it's great to have a bunch of RCTs right on everything, but they're extraordinarily not just hard to execute, but they're extraordinarily expensive. So we're in a limited, we're all in a limited resource environment. 
I mean, does it make sense that we try to spend $10 million to, you know, figure out if we should be buzzing down the acromion when we do a rotator cup repair with an RCT? I mean, because that's what it would take. I mean, companies have had to do this, for example, the subacromial balloon. They spent over $10 million to do a trial of, you know, two groups of 80 patients for that one device. And, you know, that paper was roundly criticized for a variety of reasons, not just one RCT, and that they did the right thing, right? They were trying to introduce a new technology. And I have no financial issue with that company or that device, but you know, they tried to do an RCT, which is what you want when we're introducing a new technology. It was very expensive and, you know, it didn't advance as much as they would have liked to see, right? Uh, there was just a lot of controversy with that single study. It's just very expensive to do. So how do we manage, you know, should we even be looking at some of these questions with RCTs? Because the answer is not that valuable to us because we know, you know, so, I mean, should this go to cancer research and not to subacromial decompression research? So I think some of the big data does fill that gap as well. There's value there because this data exists and it can be mined easily and affordably, and it can give us good answers to some questions. And importantly, I think it helps us. I don't think you should embark upon an RCT when you don't know much about it. You're not going to design a very good one. If you start with the big data, you can find you'll build a better RCT because it'll give you some clues. Those are the associations. Yes, we haven't determined a causation yet, but there's a lot of association clues that will help us design a very good RCT. In terms of innovation specifically, I mean, I don't think, uh, you know, you can't really use big data for it if it's new, right? It just, it's not there yet. So I don't think that's the role for it, but I mean, it's great if someone does start with an RCT but where does that money come from? Like, and then when industry does it, it's immediately criticized because it was industry sponsored. And that bias is, you know, uh, immediately, you know, puts it in a lower tier from that. But there's not a lot of sources to run high level RCTs uh, effectively. So I think uh, sometimes you mentioned, you know, it's not very impactful if you do uh, several different databases with the same question. But sometimes I think it can be just to get at the fact that is this a true result? Or can we confident could be very confident about it if you see it from different parts of the world, different databases, different population, <laughs> it's all telling you the same thing. I think we can increase our confidence level a bit about you know that conclusion. Yeah, I think I think you make uh, tremendous points. I think the biggest, you know, where does innovation sit with uh, with big data for me? It's somewhat a little bit what what Chris and Grant and the guys at Rush did is that I think that there's an area for that with EMR based studies, because if you get a cohort of surgeons or clinicians that feel very strongly and you include a champion that are innovative and that feel that one direction with regards to either a surgical technique or a prosthetic design or treatment algorithm, whatever it might be, that it, you consistently can get agreement between a small group of high volume surgeons. To me, that's the most impactful way to, to use big data to be able to hopefully um, answer some questions with regards to innovation. Because otherwise, a lot of these large databases or systematic reviews, et cetera, that um, it's, um, yeah, you're, you're never going to be answer, able to answer that question. And I think, you know, you look at like Mark Frankel, for instance, he's a perfect example where Mark was able to do it partly on his own, but he was able to be, work with a group of his fellows to be able to actually kind of conceptualize and promote this idea of a, you know, lateralized reverse shoulder replacement. And I think um, he, he, whether or not he was purposely going about doing that, but he was able to create some element of larger data sets. Um, and it, but it required a champion. And I think that any type of innovation, if you're going to try to use larger amounts of data, you need someone that truly believes in it to then push the system forward. Otherwise it's going to, it's going to fail. Um, it's great. Any other last com uh, uh, comments? Peter, you're about to say something. Oh, no, no, no. I was just looking if uh, there are any questions from that. Oh, yeah. Looks like maybe there's one. Howard actually brought up. Um, so Howard Routman, the Rumsfeld matrix applies here with regards to perceived dangers of AI ML techniques. Uh, we just don't know what we don't know. Um, how Hopefully uh, with ongoing appropriate uh, uh, criticism, 
analysis and discussion, we can start to reduce that portion of our collective knowledge deficit. And I would, I would agree um, that with with that with that uh, comment. Uh, Peter also had mentioned earlier, just to comment further on Bill's uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, discussion that we find a lot of our RCTs fail to find a difference, especially if you look at quality of life scores. Mo Bandari would say that we need thousands of patients to find a difference with these scores. Right. And I, you know, I agree with that. I think uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that those randomized trials are poorly done or they don't provide value. Um, it's just that maybe we're not using the correct instruments to be able to evaluate so, patients. Bob, uh, you and, and Chris and Uma, I'll give you a study that you can have your residents do that's easy. Go look at journals for the last 10 years. Just pull the abstract, look at what the level of evidence is, and see what the conclusion is, whether or not they found a positive finding or a neutral finding. I guarantee you level ones and twos going to be all sorts of neutral findings and level fours are all positive yep. with almost no exception. I think you're right. I think you're probably right. It's pretty, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very good, uh, insightful, uh, insightful comment. Um, well, we're about at an hour and a half, which is perfect. And um, again, I want to thank everyone. Uh, great topics, uh, great talks, great discussion. Uh, I really appreciate everyone's uh, participation uh, and taking the time. And uh, I also uh, appreciate the participants uh, staying on here. We've, we've had somewhere between 25 and 35 or so uh, people all night. So I really appreciate that. Um, our next um, uh, webinar is uh, happening September uh, 26th. And the, the topic of that is going to be um, a practical guide to paper um, uh, publication. So we're going to have a perspective from a reviewer that's a high level reviewer, uh, a high level or a frequent publisher, uh, 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 author, and then also um, Andy Green, who uh, had my role at JBJS from an editor standpoint of what makes a good paper and how to how to create a paper that's uh, publication worthy. Uh, that's what our next topic is going to be on for our next webinar. So. I appreciate everyone again uh, uh, for uh, coming tonight and uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next uh, ASCS research webinar.